The first Native American at NASA, physicist J.C. Elliott, reveals what led him to work at Mission Control during the historic Apollo program. When I was five and a half years old, I was playing outside my home in Oklahoma City on a summer day. And while I was outside, I heard something like a man's voice speaking to me. And I stopped and I listened intently. And the voice seemed to be saying, you're going to be landing men on the moon. This is your life's job. This is your life's work. Be prepared. Well, I was very uh, confused. So I went inside, told my mother there was a man outside speaking to me. So she took me to the door and she said, where is he? And I pointed up to the sun and she said, it, the voice was coming from the sun? I said, I think so. What did he say? And I told her, I said, he told me that I was gonna land men on the moon. Well, she understood because my mother was Cherokee Indian and she knew spiritually that I had been touched and been told my life's, my life's duty on this earth. So her response to me was, son, you must keep the dream, you must believe in the dream, and you also must achieve the dream. She says, nothing will happen unless you make it happen. So I kept the dream, went to school, studied in physics, University of Oklahoma. I graduated and I was in the middle of working on my master's degree in physics. And I had to take an electrical engineering course in the electrical engineering building. And it got out at 11 o'clock and I walked down the hall and my eye caught a piece of paper on the dean's office bulletin board that said NASA is hiring today. And I looked at my watch and looked at the uh, line waiting to be interviewed by NASA and thought, oh well, I'll just stay here and hope that I might be able to speak to someone. So the man from NASA was interviewing people very quickly came my turn, he interviewed me and asked me if I had a job description or application or a resume. I told him no, I didn't, but I gave him an address that he could write to and a phone number. They could contact me. When I graduated, I had to have a full-time job in order to support myself in school. So I would go to school in the mornings and I would complete the rest of the day from noon to eight o'clock at night as a police officer and deputy sheriff. But I had to go to school with my police officer's uniform on because I didn't have time to go home and change. So I interviewed the man with NASA in my police outfit and he thought that was rather unusual. He said he didn't hire security guards. And I told him I didn't want a job as a security guard. I, he said, well, what, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to land men on the moon. During this time, I had arrested a man who had been in the penitentiary for 30 years for murder and he vowed that if I took him back to jail, that he would take my life. Also, in the same week during this time, I received my draft notice from the Army to report for boot camp in 15 days. So I was caught right in between someone threatening my life locally and also uh, going to Vietnam, which was also a, a life-threatening situation. So my mother had called me and said she'd gotten a Western Union telegram from NASA and should she open it? And I said, sure. So she read it to me and they were offering me a job in the Man in Space program with a salary of 7,300 a year, which I thought was more money than I'd ever heard of in my life. And she said, well, you better call long distance and tell them that you can't take that job. And I said, okay, I'll call. So I got in touch with the man I interviewed with and explained that I was very appreciative of the invitation to go to work at NASA, but I'd have to deny uh, the job. And he said, what's wrong? Did you get drafted? And I said, yes. And he asked for my draft board chairman's uh, name, and it was Colonel Wilson. 
And he said, well, we have General Stevenson on our staff. I'd be happy to call Colonel Wilson and tell him that you're ours. And he said, you check out of school, turn in your books. And he said, be promptly in my office down here in Houston at 8 o'clock in the morning. So I did. And I, it was the first time I'd ever crossed the Red River into Texas and driven so far. It took all day to drive down to Houston. And I studied Monday morning in my brand new job and was the only person in the history of NASA that was hired without any application and no resume. I filled it all out once I got down there. Welcome to the California Science Center. I'm J.C. Elliott. I was a retrofire officer on Apollo 13 in charge of computing the return to Earth trajectories back from the moon to the Earth. What you see behind me here is the command module, which has the three astronauts, and that was their home for about 10-day missions. You can see uh, there were three couches where the astronauts would lie on liftoff, and the center couch would come out after liftoff, and they would eat and sleep and work in this kind of environment. At this time, they would be sure that they were on the right trajectory to the moon, and then they had time to do a little leisure time. And part of the time it was spent doing experiments inside the cabin, taking lots of photos. Apollo 11 and Apollo 12, the first two lunar landing missions were quite successful. And we were in preparation for Apollo 13, which lifted off on April 11, 1970. And everything was going very well smooth until about 55 hours of the mission, there was an explosion reported by the crew on board. It was approaching the, the time to do a circularization maneuver to circularize around the moon. They were not on a trajectory that would bring them back automatically. So the first task was to compute a return to Earth trajectory. It's what we call a free return trajectory. It would bring the astronauts around the moon use the gravity of the moon and the gravity of the earth to assist getting back. The explosion blew out about one-fourth of the side of the service module, and the astronauts lost all power, electricity, they lost oxygen, lost all of the things that they required to sustain them for life. And the lunar module was docked to the command module, and the crew immediately had to occupy uh, and fire up the lunar module in order to let it be a lifeboat. We manned the mission control center around the clock. There were three shifts, and my shift was getting ready to go off, and we were handing over to the next team coming on board. Well, I had left the control center, but I had not left NASA. I got in my car and was heading out towards the gate, turned on the radio, and that's when I first heard on the radio that there was a problem in space. The Apollo 13 capsule had an explosion. So before exiting the Space Center, I turned my car around and immediately drove to the Mission Control Center and walked in and there was utter chaos. Uh, people were trying to find out exactly what happened. Uh, no one had any details at all. We knew our first efforts and first priority was to return the astronauts on a trajectory that would bring them home safely back to the Earth. So that was my job as the lead retrofire officer to compute the return to Earth trajectories that would bring them around the moon and safely back to the Earth. And we could always speed up the trajectory and land at an earlier landing time, so that was part of our strategy also. Uh, there was a lot of shock in the control center. There was a lot of uh, anticipation that we may not be successful and some people had even given up some hopes not the NASA people but some of the other people but we never gave up hope we knew that we were in the throes of success and that we had to continue and press on doing what we we're doing good, good enough wasn't good enough we had to do our very best and draw upon the talents of many many people in order to be successful in this flight well, in those days, we didn't have a lot of high technology. We had mainframe IBM computers that were card readers and mag tapes, 
and it took uh, about two and a half minutes to compute a return to Earth trajectory that would bring the astronauts from the moon back to the Earth. We thought that was pretty good in those days. At the distance of the explosion, they were about 250,000 miles from the Earth. And we had to target a reentry corridor back on the Earth's atmosphere that was only eight miles wide. We targeted generally for the center of that corridor, which means we had a, a play of four miles up and four miles down in order to hit the corridor. If we did not hit the reentry corridor, and came in too shallow, it would skip off the Earth's atmosphere and go back into space. If it came in too steep, the astronauts had a, a, a chance to, to burn up because they could not withstand the reentry heat. So we had to be very careful about targeting the astronauts back in a certain place. Um, if you take 200,000, 250,000 miles and hitting an eight mile corridor, that's equivalent geometry wise of standing back 70 feet with a sewing thread and trying to thread the eye of a sewing needle 70 feet away. That's how accurate we had to be in our calculations and computations. My job pretty much ended when we got them on a trajectory that would bring them safely back to the Earth. The business on Apollo 13 was to keep them alive and sustain them on the, on the route back. So we were very conscious of how much consumables that we had, how much oxygen, how much fuel, how much water. And so we had to use things very sparingly and constantly update the trajectory to be sure that we were on target coming home, home back to the Earth. When the Apollo 13 capsule came back, it was traveling about 25,000 miles an hour. And when it first hits the entry interface or the atmosphere of the Earth, it heats up to about 7,000 degrees. Um, this is the design of the heat shield. If you look very closely, it's in the shape of a honeycomb design. And the honeycomb design came about because a scientist one day was eating lunch and noticed outside his office window a honeybee, and then he had the idea for the design of the heat shield. He got to thinking that the Honeybee makes honeycombs, and the honeycombs don't melt in the heat. And he looked at the design of the honeycomb from the bee, and it's in a hexagonal shape. And so he designed the heat shield, which each of the pieces of the heat shield are in a honeycomb design, hexagonal shape. And this turns out to be the most efficient geometrical design that will dis dissipate heat. Apollo 13 was launched. April 11, 1970, and the accident in space occurred on April the 13th at 1313 in the afternoon when it was reported on board that there was a, an explosion. The incidence of the number 13 um, was very coincidental, but uh, my console position in the Mission Control Center was also number 13. I did not succumb to fear. I certainly exercised the courage and confidence to keep a, a level head on what we needed to do. And certainly we were a team. Um, all of the positions in the control center were focused on one thing, that was survival of the crew and getting them home safely. Apollo 13 was a story of successful leadership. Yes, we did not land men on the moon, but it showed the competency the tenacity, the determination that a group of people could pull together as a team and accomplish what people thought was the impossible, we did the possible. My vision at five and a half years old of landing men on the moon was a, a spiritual happening. It didn't originate within me. And I was told that spiritually this was gonna be the, my destiny in life, was to land men on the moon. There is an unseen world that we do not experience as a human, but it takes an open mind and an open heart to open up to spiritual guidance. And I try to live my life in the balance of spiritual guidance. I never think of science as an academic pursuit. I always think of science as knowing more about the Creator's laws 
and the spiritual laws have been placed upon the earth to explore and to discover. So science didn't become an academic pursuit, but more of an extension of a way of life, of a spiritual life of my people.